that night he died. Like it was, it was insane. Like that day we went about our normal business. He got his haircut, went out to lunch with his dad, uh, bought candy, went and hung out with friends late in the afternoon. And sometime we got home about nine o'clock and we said good night. And that was it. That was the last time we saw him alive. Um, and so, you know, the following morning I went to wake him for his orthodontist appointment and it, it was too late. Like, it, it, and it, it totally blindsided us. And that was the day we learned about fentanyl. No one was talking about it at the time. We thought we were still dealing with the old days of somebody stole grandma's pills and is selling them to friends. But right. that, I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't happen anymore, but our kids don't need that path anymore. They don't need to risk getting caught because of the availability of these, what they perceive as legitimate prescriptions on social media platforms. And so from there, we're like, how, you know, how did we get here? We set out to learn from the experts in the field. Those experts include people, law enforcement, uh, U.S. retired U.S. attorneys, but the best experts I have found are 12 to 17 year olds. They inform everything that we do. And so, you know, the goal is to give, get that information out that we didn't have. So some other family doesn't have to go through this. Great. How are you? Hi, how are Hi. you? I'm Chad, Amy, I'm Shane. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, we never do that. No. <laughs> we never, we never. We never introduce ourselves like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Chad. <laughs> Shane usually tells people, Chaddict. Four T's on Instagram <laughs> if you want to get a hold of the big guy. <laughs> on Instagram. You know? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So welcome. Yeah, thank welcome. You. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. It was good timing. Uh, you know what? How did it work out? Because did Shane schedule you? Uh, I got, I, I knew when you guys were having the studio back open, yeah. so I got to pick a date and I'm in town. I go between California and Arizona a ton. Okay. Um, California is obviously where Alex died. Um, but this week there's this Project Opioid Summit happening that I was invited to. Um, they only invited the most substantial leaders. So now I'm, of course, a little bit leery about what are we exactly going to be doing this week? <laughs> are, right. we, are we joining a cult or are we going <laughs> to do some productivity? Uh, so that starts tomorrow. Where at? Uh, in Los Angeles. Wow. And then so tomorrow night. A whole weekend, a whole week? It is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then Wednesday night, I'll be speaking at a fentanyl town hall in Santa Monica. And then Friday afternoon, Friday will be the three year anniversary of Alex's yeah. passing. And then we are having the uh, um, first ever uh, social media harms victims remembrance day yep. so because my I, we lost alex on the 23rd but at the same time i was finding alex Kristen bride was finding her son carson hanging in their garage after being extremely bullied to suicide so that day seemed like a natural selection for both of us so yeah. we've been working on it this last year <clears throat> well we're sorry for your loss uh, deeply yeah. yeah um this podcast exists because i lost my son-in-law on uh, 9-11 my my 22 year old daughter found him dead in his bed from a fentanyl poisoning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I've been, I've worked in addiction treatment for, um, 22 years. Uh, I've never seen anything as insane as what's going on right now. Like it's absolutely insane. Um, three years that, that, uh, the fentanyl crisis has been going on. Um, and, I, and I've how seen are we still here, right? Yeah. How, how, are, we, how are we still here? I, I can't get wrapped up in that question. I lose my mind. Well, I mean, we like, can, you can be loud and, 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 and aggressive here because that's what, <laughs> that's what we are. Like I'm, Good. I've already, like I've gone, I'm, we're at war against mm -hmm. fentanyl, mm -hmm. which means that we're at war against anybody that isn't doing anything about it. Yeah. Um, it's tough. <clears throat> like you, you said poisoning. Yeah. I get that. We use that term all the time, but man, we get blasted for it because you know, we, People act like we say that because it, it minimizes their kids' deaths who died maybe more from a traditional overdose who had a long-term addiction and, and finally died. But that's not why I do it. It's got nothing to do with that. And in fact, right. all all drug deaths should be labeled a poisoning because, like, what's the recommended dose of heroin? Yeah. yeah. 
here, but here we are kind of battling that, but I got a good, I feel like I got a good reason for it. Not necessarily because I feel like that's what happened to Alex, but because saying poisoning breaks down stigma and yeah. parents, parents will listen to me. If I say right. overdose, they're like, Oh, oh, he was a drug addict. Oh yeah. Oh. Overdose. That doesn't, that's not going to happen in my house. So, oh, it will. Yeah. With fentanyl. You know, yeah, exactly. 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 So, you know, it breaks down that stigma and gets at least the age group and pe- the demographic I'm trying to reach yeah. open their mind a little bit. You had bit. a guy who was smoking weed. And there was fentanyl in the fucking weed. Yeah. And he had to Narcan back. Oh, it's amazing that he was able to do that. Oh, it's I should crazy. have brought you guys some Cluxado. Are you guys familiar with Cluxado? No. Oh, my gosh. It's a, so uh, Narcan's the four milligram naloxone. Yeah. Cluxado is a, a eight milligram. Mm. And so in theory, we know it takes two or more in the incarcerated population in California to bring people back. So in theory, you're starting out with more California doesn't have good, or at least I haven't found good data on it, just the general population. Right. So you're, you know, hopefully bringing people back sooner. Yeah. Um, but, and then there's also another one called Zim high that, and I don't know if you guys know. So with the nasal sprays, only half the medicine lands. So two mm. milligrams, four milligrams. And then there's an injectable called Zim high that you literally just inject into the thigh. It's a five milligram and all of that medicine will land. Right. We have that. We have a uh, injectable, um, some of us, a little bit around here. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Most people are general public, you know, scared to use that, but people who've been yeah. dealing with addiction or substance use disorder, I don't know what your guys' preferred term is. That doesn't but matter. I, <laughs> whatever. But you know, I mean, if I'm working outside uh, and I'm being professional, it's substance mm-hmm. use disorder, but I, I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like that term. I mean, I know that they're trying to make it minimize it, but like, like I, I was, a, I was an addict. I'm a recovering addict. Um, I didn't have a substance use disorder. Mm-hmm. I abused substances. Mm-hmm. I didn't just use them. I abused them. And then they abused me. You know? How long have you been sober? Um, currently over six years. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I, thank I actually, God, right? yeah, thank God. I mean, I actually don't, I, I stopped counting time because I've been uh, in recovery since 1996. Okay. Is when I first found uh, the rooms mm-hmm. of, uh, step programs okay. and I um I just stopped counting time because I I, I became I had um, almost nine years and I relapsed and I became a chronic relapser for a while okay and there's a lot of stigma and shame sure. and guilt and stuff that came around that so and they always talk about 24 hours right even in the rooms 24 hours 24 hours how can we have to do a 30-day walk of shame <laughs> you know if I'm just as good, I mean, I know they, they do that and then they want to clap for you, but when you've had time and then people are clapping for you and then people are talking, oh, look at it, there he is again. Oh. He's walking down the aisle. Did, didn't he just take a newcomer chip like 90 days ago? All right, well, sell your newcomer again. Yeah, <laughs> like, I just don't do it. Okay. I don't do that whole that whole deal that anymore. Whole, yeah. nope. no. I got up at 3 a.m. this morning, so I have more time than a lot of people. Yeah. People will pass me up, though, because I'm going to go to bed at 8. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad bedtime. I that's wouldn't argue with that's that one. Good, right? I know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to bed at eight yeah. and people mm-hmm. are going to pass me up. But mm-hmm. currently I probably have more time than most people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just cause I've been up longer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but do you find now that, okay, so it's been six years in the six years where, you know, the fentanyl crisis is ramped up. Do you think people are kind of getting robbed of that chance of recovery because yeah. of fentanyl? I mean, not even necessarily because they're dying, but because it's so highly addictive that they never have that aha moment of like, oh, I, today's the day, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't even know. They come in, they get tested, and they're crystal meth or they're whatever. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah, it's I have a friend who's, um, a friend who I made in this working, because she works for, she works for the Army National Guard, does drug demand reduction yeah. and outreach. Uh, her brother died from um, fentanyl, but I was watching one of her presentations and she's talking about things and she talks about her, how her brother died from meth that had fentanyl in it. And I was like, wait a minute, are you sure he didn't die from the fentanyl? And she was like, I, 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 I really caught her off guard. It was uncomfortable. I made her uncomfortable. I made the whole room uncomfortable. And I left right after the, her presentation. And two days later she calls me and she's like, can we talk? I show up, I meet her. And the first words out of her mouth is like, I get it. I went to your website. I get it. I called his doctor and his doctor said, oh yeah, if that fentanyl wasn't in there, your brother would probably still be alive today. For sure. Yeah. I've put, a, I've put a lot of methamphetamines in my body and I didn't die. Yeah. I was an IV meth user. That was my drug of wow. choice. Yeah. 
to the point of uh, schizophrenia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Drug-induced psychosis. Yeah. Thought I worked for the CIA. All kinds of crazy stuff. Wow. But, you know. Did you journal any of that? I'm just curious. I'm nosy. I'm really nosy, you guys. I've become very nosy since it's I was good to be like away. That. I want, no. I'm fascinated. It's all right here. I have yeah. it all. I know it all. I know everything that happened yeah. during my psychosis. It's, 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 it's wild. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to put it out, uh, but I'm kind of saving it cause I want to turn it into a movie. Okay. It's pretty good. Cool. So I haven't like, haven't told my full story sure. yet cause I don't want some. Yeah. To keep to, some of it. Yeah, secret, I don't want yeah. somebody <laughs> to steal my movie. <laughs> it's a really good movie. I don't blame you. So, um, I'm going to jump right in. Yeah. Sure. Uh, jump right in. What brings you to doing what you're doing these days? So, uh, I'll give you the short ish version. Uh, so, uh, June of 2020, uh, my son Alexander was acting odd, right? He was had this funky 10 days in, in June of 2020. And I went, I went to him, I'm like, what's going on, dude? Like, are you using something? What is happening? Like, we had prepared ourselves for our child's experimental phase because he's that kid that came home from the first drug prevention week when he was seven years old and was like, ooh, tell me more. What does it mean to alter my mind and my body? What's happening? Like, what does it feel like? It was this fascinating idea to him. And so at that time, we we're like, ooh, we're, we're in trouble. And so lo and behold, that day came. But we know we educated ourselves. We educated him. Those conversations got more and more mature. And so when the time came, it was he, he was not surprised by me asking him something like that. And because we had those conversations. And his response was, no, mom, I was, I was up late. I ate something bad. And of course, 14 years old, he's in the height of puberty. So the mood swings that were happening were in line with his big personality. But about a day and a half later, he came back to us and says, okay, I got to talk to you guys. He sat us down at the kitchen table and proceeded to tell us, and this is the short version, uh, I wanted to experiment with Oxy. I got some from a drug dealer on Snapchat. It has a hold on me and I don't know why. We were ready for this moment. We knew where to call. We knew what to do that following morning. I called the treatment place. They needed to call me back with their recommendations. That night he died. Like it was, it was insane. Like that day we went about our normal business. He got his hair cut, went out to lunch with his dad, uh, bought candy, went and hung out with friends late in the afternoon. And sometime we got home about nine o'clock and we said good night. And that was it. That was the last time we saw him alive. Um, and so, you know, the following morning I went to wake him for his orthodontist appointment and it, it was too late, like, it, it, and it, it totally blindsided us, and that was the day we learned about fentanyl. No one was talking about it at the time. We thought we were still dealing with the old days of somebody stole grandma's pills and is selling them to friends, but right. that, I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't happen anymore, but our kids don't need that path anymore. They don't need to risk getting caught because of the availability of these, what they perceive as legitimate prescriptions on social media platforms, and so... From there, we were like, how, you know, how did we get here? We set out to learn from the experts in the field. Those experts include people, law enforcement, uh, U.S. retired U.S. attorneys, but the best experts I have found are 12 to 17-year-olds. They inform everything that we do, and so, you know, the goal is to give, get that information out that we didn't have so some other family doesn't have to go through this. Right. It's tough. <laughs> yeah, it really, really is. I mean... I woke up this morning, checked my email, and the first email I had was from a family who lost their kid back on June 17th of this year. I mean, this Friday will be three years we lost Alex, and how is this still happening every single day? Every day. Every, every five day. minutes, actually. Every day. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's outrageous. I, I, uh, it is outrageous. And, like, what, why, why is nothing being done? I mean, there's, and that is why I'm building this platform. Um, I have, uh, I just want you to know that, you know, that I, I got a phone call on uh, Sunday, uh, 7.30 a.m. Um, on September 11th of my daughter screaming. Thought it was weird that she was calling me that early because she's never up that early. Um, but she had gone out with some friends and um, she was coming back home to my house. And she was trying to get a hold of Justin on the way, and he wasn't answering, wasn't answering. So she thought, I'll just stop by because um, they were having a little bit of problems. And he had been drinking a little bit, and um, <clears throat> he had 
moved back in as dad's for like the last 30 days. She thought he was doing great. And um, so she went to the house. She knocked on the door. Nobody answered. Um, she went around back, went inside, and, uh, and he was blue. Yeah, I know that look. And, uh, it, you know, those those things don't leave you. No. Those phone calls don't leave you. I can remember exactly what I said to my sister and my dad when I called them that day. Like they, It's almost like you're watching a movie. It's like this, yeah. you're, you're viewing it that day of your life. Those things just don't leave you. No. So kind of like you, um, you know, I've turned my, uh, my pain into anger and, um, and I'm, and Shane and I decided to build this platform. <laughs> Part of the platform is this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, the podcast is growing uh, rapidly. Our social medias are growing rapid, rapidly. And I have, I have resources. I have like almost unlimited resources, so like I'm going after it. Oh, that's incredible. You know, I, uh, I, I was fortunate because, um, you know, the past 20 years of my life, I have built treatment centers and, um, they're very successful treatment centers and, um, they, uh, run themselves now and I have nothing like they They didn't know what monster they were waking up <laughs> when they sold my son-in-law fentanyl. Wow. Because I won't, I won't stop. Just like yeah. you, I we, won't. We can't, won't, right? No. Like to like, me, if, if I stop, that's life's lost. Because somebody is going to hear me. I, mean, I travel the country. I talk to anyone and everyone. Um, like my target audience, I was 12 to 17 year olds and their families. Uh, and if I don't go talk to them, it's, it's almost a compulsion. Yeah. I, I don't know if it feels that way for you, but I have this compulsion to do it. And then if I don't, I feel like the world's going to fall apart. And I know yeah. that's not realistic and I, it's, that's not what's going to happen. And I know it's possible. The, <laughs> I'll damn it. Now I have to, I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels like it sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It feels like, I it. mean, when you say that, it's like your world will fall. Yeah. Apart. That's yeah, what I was you're saying. Right. It that's, will. That's, you're right. My world would fall apart if I didn't saying. have this yes. work to do right yeah, now. And healthier. If it's a healthy way to do it or not, that's, it's what Who I'm cares? doing until I crash and burn. Yeah. Yes. Well, I won't stop doing this until 300 million or whatever the population of the United States is. And then some have heard me talk about right. fentanyl and heard me talk about the fact that, you know, uh, a drug dealer sold my, my son-in-law press Percocet. You just gave me an idea. We'll have to talk afterwards. But idea just popped in my head. <laughs> we'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> And I, and I just won't stop and I won't stop until I have a big enough following. And mm -hmm. when I say following, I don't mean people standing behind me. I mean, people standing beside mm -hmm. me, supporting, Absolutely. supporting, uh, our movement, yeah. you know, um, and it's, you know, uh, uh, fentanyl is on the, is on the forefront because that's, what's killing everybody. Right. It's, right. It is killing. But it'll be something else. I mean, it'll be something else yeah. deadlier, more deadly and, and even more difficult when it comes to being addicted or having substance use disorder, like it, th and it's not going anywhere anytime soon though. No. And I, I don't but know. But you know what they would do? So when let's, let's say, let's say 300 people are dying every day from fentanyl. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Okay. That's the numbers mm -hmm. that I truly believe are the mm -hmm. real numbers. So we know it's underreported big yeah. time. Yeah. It's way underreported. Mm -hmm. So I, I call it, let's call it what it really is. 300 people, even if it's 180, but it's 300 people mm -hmm. because 120,000 people died in 2020 two from uh opioid ov uh, overdoses mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. well i'm gonna guess that 95 percent of those were fentanyl sure yeah um so 300 people is a very large airplane going down mm -hmm. every, every single day, day right okay. every day mm -hmm. if that happened three days in a row Oh, in the United States, we would ground all the we planes. We would ground yeah. all planes. Mm -hmm. Why in the fuck aren't we down yeah. in the, at the border uh, grounding all uh, fentanyl coming across? You know, I'm going to tell you, in my experience in meeting with poli with legislators, uh, federally I'm speaking, uh, it, everybody wants to, to be the hero. There's this lack of communication across the aisle, and this goes for both sides. I'm not. Oh, yeah, I'm not no. picking sides no, here. I'm, this is a this is a non side issue. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be the hero. They and so therefore they're not going to cooperate with somebody else to make it happen. Meanwhile, people are dying. Twelve to seventeen year olds are the fastest growing demographic for death right now. Yeah, but I guess that's not important enough to you know put aside your differences and get the job done. I mean, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if they truly. Uh, you know, until they do something, I don't know that they truly care. 
maybe they're part of this this bigger plan of annihilating yeah. our 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 youth. Yeah. And when I say that, that you know, there's a there's a a book on war, or if you go back into to the old times, they killed people that were of war age, um, which is technically like sixteen to twenty eight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they killed those people so that they can't build a bigger army. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, China's killing our our youth. Yeah, um, Jim Ross. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Families Against Fentanyl. He's probably leading that. Uh, the weapons of mass destruction movement. He's he's amazing. Yeah. You guys should check out his website. What's yeah. his name? Jim Raw. Jim Raw. Families Against Fentanyl Families is his organization. Fentanyl, yeah. yeah. Write that down. I will. Yeah. Got it. They're great. You got it. I got it. I don't got believe it. you. Don't <laughs> I'll give you notes afterwards. Yeah. That's why I got it. She's never going to forget. Uh, so yeah, we need to know everybody because like we're we're building a platform that uh, uh, is going to be so huge that all of these all of these people would they mm-hmm. need to come down. Right. They'll need to be on it. They'll need to be a part of it. Um, cause we're going, I, I have, uh, good friends that are, uh, federal politicians. Mm-hmm. Um, they still aren't doing anything about it, but, and I'm going after them. I okay. am going oh, yeah. after them. And we should, I, I, you know, I've been working with, uh, so I don't work so much on the fentanyl legislation cause there's a lot of people working on that, there, but I feel like I can be more impactful in the social media space. And so I've been going after a lot of that, uh, that, um, legislation and so the primary people i've worked with i'm like okay if we don't have anything by the end of this year it's gonna get ugly Um, we'll stop playing nice and and it's gonna get personal yeah we're not gonna play nice we'll play nice until for for a little while 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 we're building this platform but the, (laughs) the, the one thing that they don't realize is that um you know addicts and alcoholics we we actually have a tradition in our and i keep saying this right but it's so freaking true we have a tradition that we, it doesn't matter what race, religion, mm-hmm. political background you are, color of your skin, uh, your sex doesn't nothing mm-hmm. none none of that matters. We all act, can actually come together for a common cause. Yeah, I've seen it. And I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, we do it every day in twelve step meetings. Yeah, oh, like yeah. we sit together and you know um, and come together, and you know that it, it's it's really sad because our country, our our politicians our media they're dividing us on purpose um because a divided country is weak you know and um we can't be divided anymore and i'm gonna bring everybody back together and um you know we're gonna go after this this crisis i mean what is legislation gonna do it's not go to go to to fucking war with the cartels like they're the ones bringing it across the border you send down a thousand marines they could take care of it we could have we could fix things quickly yeah well i don't like i said i don't get wrapped up in that side of things I, that's why i focus on the education and awareness because yeah. meanwhile while we're waiting for things to happen and those sides of things people have to know yeah i mean knowledge is power a little bit of information would have gone a long way that night alex poured his heart out to us you know i'd probably how do you mean it. had we known about fentanyl yeah. we would have reacted very differently you know, we thought, like okay, reacted immediately. Maybe yeah, stayed it, up all it night. would have, we would have Narcan, like, maybe, yeah, all the things I would have even, pro- I probably would have taken him to the hospital that night. Right. I would have realized he was poisoning himself I, and we would have put him into some kind of, you know, immediate detox. But as it was, we, we thought it was a prescription pill. And I remember saying to him that day, Alex, please don't take any pills today. I didn't ask if he had any, you know, I obviously, I wish I did things dif- way differently, but He's like, oh, no, mom, I won't because I've only, I've only been taking them every other day. And so I, I believed him. And, and which is, I know I realize that's ridiculous now to have believed that statement. Um, but I think he believed he was only had only taken them every other day. And again, it had been maybe 10 days at the most. It was in that 10 days, he was probably, t- it was from the best I can tell, that was probably the seventh pill he took. And it just happened to be the one that, had was loaded and had enough fentanyl right. to kill four people in it. So it, it, that, that Sunday night when he talked to us, it, we would have, you know, like I always joke, like I would have chained him to his bed, but I really would have taken him to the emergency room and we would right. have spent the night there. Yeah. I said on one of the podcasts when with my daughter, the, when we were doing a podcast with her that like, you know, and I, I, I'm just saying I have guilt, you know, I have guilt. Like I own treatment centers and, and you know, I knew, I knew that something wasn't right. And I'm like, well, I could have done more, you know, and always in hindsight, I feel like I, you know, you can do more. I right. could have done more, yeah. but it's the angel devil thing on your shoulder, yeah. right? It's it like, is, if only, if only, if only, 
but you know at the end of the day like i'm not gonna let his death be in vain <laughs> Right. Like he's not dying for nothing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's how we felt about Alex. His, his death couldn't be so some drug dealer can make a couple bucks. Like this is not okay. Yeah. This is not. And again, like after Alex died, the amount of families I met afterwards, I've gone through the same thing, just blew my mind. Like it, again, why are we not talking about this? How could, because we thought we were unique at first, right? That this is some weird one off accident no it's but no it's, it's a common common occurrence we had it's, no ha idea. it's happening more often to people that are not full-blown drug addicts mm -hmm. than um to the people that are full-blown drug yeah, addicts it's happening to we, everybody we go out and you know we've been out on the streets and the the people that are out on the streets that are very addicted to mm -hmm. fentanyl they're literally not dying because mm -hmm. they're they feel the tolerance yeah how do we help them because now they, well, they, see, they, they the have no problem. control of their brain at this point. How do we help them and in and, the state of and California? The, and the resources are very, very mm -hmm. slim. If you don't have insurance, it's hard to get into a treatment facility. And in, in the state of California, it's nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't ask somebody to call every day for a bed. Right? Because you know, that moment it, will pass. It will. They're not going to be able to do it. It just doesn't happen. That's other stuff that like I'm going to be fighting for on this platform is that everybody deserves to go to treatment. And I'm also going to be fighting against the insurance companies who are giving uh, really shitty care yeah. to people that actually do have private insurance. Mm -hmm. You know what? Well, we can get people in and get them detoxed and get them like two weeks of yeah, but inpatient then what? residential. Two weeks isn't enough for fentanyl. No. Right. So, so like, it's a I revolving mean, door for mm -hmm. them. Mm hmm. You know, and they want to give, they want, they, they want us to give better care and pay us less money. That's what's going on <laughs> in this world right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's insane. I mean, that maybe that's the biggest thing we should be advocating for is just better care in general. And hopefully there's a trickle down effect, right? Right. And we're advocating it through, you know, just through the general population and then also through veterans. Cause like vet veterans have like gone out and, uh, uh risked their lives and you know, they're dying every day, 22 yeah. from mm -hmm. suicide. And probably a shit ton more from fentanyl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, there's just an uh, uh, article that just came out about the army, how hard it's hitting the army, the mm. fentanyl deaths. It's insane. Yeah. It's just pure insanity. Yeah. We're living in crazy times. Yeah. And then, you know, from my perspective, our kids are like this giant experiment with the marijuana industry and uh, social media. And yeah. like they, it's almost like they don't stand a chance. Yeah. Like I can't imagine being a teen right now. No, I was nope. thinking the same thing yeah. like before because the stuff that I used to do, I wouldn't want that out on social media. Right, right. I wouldn't. Sure. Nope. <laughs> what about you? Bro, I'm just listening here and it's um, a lot of pain. Oh, yeah. You know, just a lot of pain, man. And, and, and her getting her voice out there, it's a lot of education because these kids are still feeling mentally off. Mm -hmm. They're sad. They're depressed. They're going through puberty. Yep. They don't know what they're feeling. It's all new to them. It's all very new. In fact, every every high school, middle school that I go and present at or youth group or whatever yeah. the case may be, I was just did two different youth, uh, youth conferences this summer. Uh, I give them my personal information uh, yeah. because they, whether per it's perceived or it's real, they are not sure who their trusted adult is. Right. And so I'm like, Alex trusted me. Please call me. Yes. And so I get text. I'm feeling like suicide. You know, I don't think I'm not going to do it tonight, but these things, these are the things that I'm thinking about. Or uh, my best friend is using pills. I'm scared. What do I do? Or can I get naloxone because I'm worried about my own parents' drug use? Like it, you, wow. I get a gamut of questions wow. or comments or things that people need help with. And so I find, I put those kids in connection with who and what can help them in their area That's heavy. I, or help them troubleshoot who their trusted wow. adult is. What a responsibility. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I do turn my phone off every night at eight o'clock though. There's no recreational nice. drug use anymore. No. Those days are over. Absolutely kids over. Kids should, I mean, let's be honest. Kids should, I mean, we're born to experiment. I'm not talking drugs. Sure. I'm just, just talking in general. in general. We're born, we have to experiment. That's how we grow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Drugs just happen to be part of that experimentation. And that's just what call, that's what life is. Yeah. It just is. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with you. And I watch these shows that are kind of geared toward teens and they glamorize all the drug use yeah. and it, they make it look very enticing and, and right. like, Ooh, that's kind of a fun thing to do. And then of course, social media, 
you know, you, you see these things enough times, like the first time you see it, you might think, oh man, that's, that's scary. That's weird. That's odd. I, I would never do that. But 20 times later, it's yeah. totally normalized. Yeah. These, their frontal lobes, you know, totally underdeveloped yeah. and, and now it looks normal. And yeah. now they're apt to try these things or to believe somebody who they think is their friend. Who's just trying to make a couple bucks off of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really bad, you know, and, um, we're, we're actually trying to, uh, uh, show that it's fun to have a sober lifestyle. Yeah. I think that's a fabulous idea. Yeah. I mean, how hard that sh- doesn't seem like it should be that difficult of a, of a message to get out there, but I just don't, I just don't like, you can't really achieve in life. Like very few people can do drugs and alcohol on a regular basis and become high achievers. Mm -hmm, And if they do become high achievers, they're not the best version of themselves Mm -hmm. like internally. Sure. Well, I'd imagine maybe they're a high achiever, but over the course of time, that's going to go away. Right. So, you know, there's a lot in the, uh, just, you know, you go into the, the, the the music industry Mm -hmm. and all those different uh, industries, you see all the partying and the, Mm -hmm. And all of that. And I mean, and that's always been right. It's always, but now it's like, uh, if you, if you go out and do some Coke, you might not, you might not, you might not wake that. up. Mm-hmm. And that's a scary thing. People are, and how do we get people to believe that though? That's what I was just saying. Like, how do we, that's the hard part. That these, and especially at 14 to 17, like you're going mm-hmm. after, how do you tell them, Hey, I know you're feeling sad. It's going to go away in a day or two or a month right? or two months. And they're like, Holy fuck. I can't wait that long. Two months or, is like an eternity. Right? I can't feel like this. It, it does. It does sound like an eternity. But everything that we do that we put out there is informed by teens. Yeah. They are like my biggest group of mm-hmm. experts. I love them so much. And I run my stuff by them. I'm like, do I sound like an old lady when I say this? Like, yeah. tell me what's going on. And so I think I bring, when I visit with teens, I bring, I think I bring some credibility, the fact that I use them in my work. And so hopefully they believe me. And I always tell them, I said, you, you might not believe me come tomorrow. You might not ever remember I was here, but I hope that when these things come up, something will trigger in your memory. And you're like, Oh yeah. Like what was that sad lady saying at my school? Right. Oh yeah. We shouldn't do this. And hopefully that it will be enough. But we also have a peer to peer prevention program where we basically, and that's where these teens experts come from is where we uh, have um, the prevention training and we train them on social media harms. We talk to them about the fentanyl crisis, what they're facing and what they're up against. And that has evolved into now that is youth led. So it's youth to youth teaching each other about those things. And I'm just kind of the old lady that's there yeah. in the corner, making sure that the facts are straight and we're, we're, we're okay. So that, and again, that's, you know, that's a very small scale, but over time, hopefully we can, grow that and scale that that's my plan this next year and we have a a counseling program that we should be launching this fall Um, fingers crossed everything goes according to plan well we'd like to donate a thousand dollars yeah so we'll write you a check later i'll send it to you if you could be our guest we'll we'll donate a thousand dollars to your cause thank you so much yeah of course wow yeah that's incredible thank you of course (laughs) yeah i'm always i don't know why it takes me back but every time somebody is helpful or wants to do something i'm always like wow they want to help us like that's so amazing you don't that's so amazing thank you listen no one should ever have to go through what you go to i mean you're gonna i mean yeah man it's i can't even start you know what i'm saying i can't even fucking start it's too much for me it's a, it's a lot you should yeah. come hang out with me for a day uh, I, I, <laughs> come out just for a couple of days <laughs> oh i'll come i'll go to the schools with you i'll do whatever you want me to when you're down here no worries yeah 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 yeah, yeah i'm all yours for sure you're going to fly across country? I, I'll drive. It's, exi- it's exhausting. I'll drive oh, to you're not, start. You're just, not a flyer. I haven't been to a flyer. I'll tell you what. I'm kind of getting sick of it yeah, right now. <laughs> that was it. It was just so much. I said, you know what? That's it. It's been two years. Yeah. I, I did a lot of, I've done a little bit of traveling since, you know, since all, all the restrictions lifted and everything. And man, air travel sucks these days. Oh, yeah. it's just I it's haven't exhausting. been on a flight that wasn't delayed. Oh, yeah. No, I've been very fortunate in that respect. And I'm the type that I get to my gate like 10 minutes before I have to be there. I'm like, I'm getting on. I'm getting out. I'm not spending too much time in this airport. It gives me if my flight gets delayed, I'm not trapped in the airport. I kind of have a system to it unless it's a holiday travel. Don't do that. summer. But uh, yeah, it's it's been interesting. But the the year. um, So 2020 through 2021, I probably traveled more than I had my entire life at that point. I can't believe how much I traveled at the beginning after Alex died. It was crazy. So how did you put everything together uh, after after he died, and then you um, 
how did you start so doing all of this? I uh, it I right out of the gate, my my family put together the nonprofit. They they did all of those things because we all they're like this death can't be Alexander couldn't have died for nothing. Like my family was amazing and how they rallied around us and mm. and helped really get things started. And so from there, uh, we I started reaching out to schools. I started with the, the middle school that Alex had gone to. And I was like, Hey, can I come talk to you to the, to the, uh, his school counselor at the time. And we chatted and she was like, Oh, I'm going to introduce you to the PTA. And then I talked to people at the PTA. And then, uh, it was, um, the, because I love you program in orange County, Gina from there, I, I believe they were the first people to book me for a presentation or a conversation, whatever you want to call it. I'm not crazy about the word presentation. And so from there, it just kind of evolved. And I've gone to a couple of conferences and then I meet people there. Like I really, everything I do is on referral at this point. Um, it, it just kind of snowballed from there. I would have never in a million years guessed I'd be as busy as I am. I think I've probably seen, and, and it just sounds insane when I say it, but in the last year and a half, I'm pretty sure I've seen at least 150,000 people. Um, but I, I thought I would just do high school presentations and teach yoga, stick to teaching yoga. Like I really thought that was going to be my life and I could have never imagined this been crazy tell us a little bit more about it like what 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 all do you do so <laughs> it's crazy so uh, schools are my, obviously where my passion is mm. talking to the middle yeah. schoolers and high schoolers i typically mm. show our dead on arrival film which is on our website if anybody wants to watch it and then i do a little slideshow presentation try to keep it kind of conversational with the youth i also do a social media harms and self-esteem presentation with the youth that is developed by the youth I ha they help me develop both my presentations those are my two core ones and then they kind of inter are interchangeable when depending on what the the event calls for. So I've had meetings with um, federal legislators. Uh, I spoke in front of the House Energy and Commerce Committee about the dangers of social media. I, I meet, have met with, like I said, law enforcement. I've done presentations in living rooms where moms bring their friends in and we have a conversation when their school area won't let us come in. Uh, so, um, Capo Unified here where Alex went to school and you guys are located in that district. Uh, they were amazing. Uh, once the, the ball got rolling, they've let me in a lot to their schools. They have a community um, liaison who is, she's Sonia. She's been fantastic about getting the schools to have me come in. And then I've also, in addition to the foundation, we have a coalition uh, that uh, the foundation's the fiscal agent for. And so I run that coalition. It's a very localized thing. But that has turned into me educating other coalitions across the country who are not maybe up to speed on the fentanyl epidemic and the social media harm. So I come in and I do that training. I've done continuing education units for uh, um, um, medical, the med medical professionals and various health insurance programs, like you name it. I've, I've talked to probably that group. It's, it's been wild. It's been a really wild year and a half. Nice. Well, it's just amazing. You know, some people want to just, they just go down. Yeah. Through the pain. And you just, you know, the exact opposite. Yeah. It, well, and we can't fault them for that, right? I wish I wish I could get those people out of bed and get them to come with me. But I've always been that parent. I was Alexander Scout leader. Yeah. I was PTA mom. I was room mom. I, I, I knew all of his friends up until like six months before he died, before, you know, yeah. he kind of got a new group of friends and the pandemic hit. So we didn't have that connection with those new friends yet. Uh, I was, I was nosy. Um, ish, yeah. not, uh, but not to a fault. I don't think, uh, Alexander, in fact, Alexander, Alexander's biggest complaint about his dad and I is that he overshared with us. And to me, that was a win, right? Yeah. I mean, and there would be times I'd be like, well, I can't believe he told us that. Like, why is this kid telling us that? In fact, I had to learn how to listen to him because he would talk and I would want to problem solve. Yeah. And so I got to the point where I'm like, okay, are you telling me to vent? Or are you telling me because we want to figure out a solution? He's like, okay, I'm venting today. And so then I would know my mom course of action with him. But it was it was fascinating. And his friends were always wonderful and, you know, a good group of kids that he had grown up with all through elementary school and middle school. And and I loved, ha you know, having that, having being able to be a part of his life like that and getting to know these other families and, and really kind of having that path where we were involved. And, again, it just goes to show you that it's not enough. No. You know? It's important to be, I, I mean, I'm nosy. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to be really nosy. Mm -hmm. I think it's important when your kids are gone, you look in their drawers, mm -hmm. you look in their notebooks, you look in their bags. Uh, that's just how I am. 
Oh yeah, we weren't. We you know we had an open door policy at home. No. Uh, internet went off at our house at nine o'clock. I spot checked his social media, but in all honestly, I, I honestly I would have never known the what the drug emoji for? code. Nobody was talking about that at the time. So maybe I saw something and I just didn't know that I was looking for sexual predators and bullies because uh, that's what these companies told us to look for. And right. I believe that. And obviously now that I'm in this space, it goes so much deeper than those uh, two things. There's so much, so many harms out there our kids face on these platforms, you know, and I tell parents after they see a presentation of mine, you know, their knee jerk reaction is to want to run home and tell their kids to take Snapchat off their phone, which that's not going to solve anything, no. right? That's going to create a whole nother dynamic of tension in the house. So I always tell them, Ask your kid what they already know. Like, hey, what have you seen about drugs on Snapchat? And the way they answer that question will tell that parent everything they need to know. But sometimes they don't know anything, and that's great. But somebody's bullied them. Somebody's sending them inappropriate pictures. And they're willing. our kids are willing to accept that for a couple of reasons. It's the Internet, and that's just how things are on social media. And two, they won't tell their parents because they're worried about losing their privileges that whole fear of missing out they're going to get their phone taken away they're going to not be allowed on these FOMO. platforms yep yeah. and so they won't tell their parents even though it's making them sick and they're not it, yeah. it's it's damaging them it's their mental health it's crazy is there any drug emoji codes that are uh oh my gosh there's all kinds um i should send you guys the the sheet so if you go to, if you just search drug emoji code on um on the internet, the DEA drug emoji code information will come up. But the biggest one, if there is a plug, now maybe, should I say this? Because then people might go look for it as a, as a connection, right? If there is a plug in their profile, nine times out of 10, they're a drug dealer. It's the hookup. They're going to get you the oh, hookup. The plug. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yep, exactly. That's it. You can see all of that right there. And I mean, as a parent, even if I saw that, like if I see that how it says dealer advertising, how would I know what that meant as a parent? You know, like they, what it, that looks like nothing to me. Weird, they got the Canadian symbol for universal for drugs. Right, right. <laughs> Canadian. Crazy. Canadians. I mean, a cookie is so innocent, but that means they've got a large batch of drugs. Wow. Right. It is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. But it's it's definitely helpful, and of course, this is always changing too because drug dealers are smart, right? Kids are smart. I mean, they can't be using the pill, the, 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 the pill emoji anymore. You would think that they're not, um, but I've seen it show up in some things. Still to this day, I have somebody out of New York who sends me stuff that they find on Snapchat all the time. Right. And it stuff still comes up, you would think. But, you know, so these social media companies like, oh, yeah, we search for those things or we have tools that remove that content. But, you know, it evolves. They start misspelling words a certain way. And so now you start knowing how to look for those things. And so it is not when these social media companies come out and say what they're doing, it is never enough. It's always just, you know, scratching the surface. It's a PR move. There's always more Mm -hmm. they can do. And the top top three right there, uh, Percocet and Oxycodone, Xanax and Mm -hmm. Adderall, Fake prescription drugs, all of those are fentanyl. Yeah, all of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. There, are prob- there might not even be any Adderall oh, or no. Xanax in, yeah. the, uh, in, no. in the actual pill. Oh, yeah. No, unless you're getting this stuff from a doctor. There's, it's not, mm-hmm. that's, that's all, it's all fent- fentanyl, mm-hmm. right. all of it. It's right. all fake. No matter what. It's all, even the, you know, even the, the, the fake stuff that's being uh, made and manufactured in Mexico, it's being manufactured in the same uh, yeah. exact um, pill machines yeah. as the fentanyl yeah. anyway so there's fentanyl and it's like that's happening it's like yeah you you put that there might have been one grain in this pill over mm-hmm. here but if there's two grains sure. in that one you're fucking dead yeah, yeah. absolutely dead absolutely dead. and you know the uh, fentanyl's crossed into the uh tourist tourism prescription market in uh in Mexico. Yeah. So even those, those are all counterfeit too. Even the, well, you can't even go to the pharmacy in Mexico. Mm-hmm. I heard that the yeah. other day. Yeah. They're, it's, it, they're not, they're counterfeit and they were, you know, typically counterfeit before they just never had the active ingredient yeah, exactly. in it, but maybe fentanyl wasn't in there, but fentanyl is in it now. Yeah. Fentanyl yeah. is in it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is, LA yeah. times ran an article a few months back on that. And there was a more recent one that came out. I don't remember who ran it, but it's, it's a thing. It's real partnership for safe medicines. If you guys aren't familiar with them, they're great on, Tracking counterfeits, that's what they do, and they work on legislation for that. Shabir over there is really fantastic, so that's another great resource. Nice. How do parents stay on their kids? I mean, oh, you, you were on your kid. You, 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 did, you didn't want to hover. You didn't want to push them away. Mm-hmm. You, you were snoopy to a degree. 
you had a, what you've said is a good relationship. You felt he was honest. Like, why would he tell me that mm-hmm. at times? You know, I just want to make sure that parents don't get back on their heels you and know, not keep being snoopy, even though the kid is being honest mm-hmm. at times. And don't get relaxed. When, well, and what happens is our kids are smart, right? Yeah. And and I meet parents all the time, when I, especially when I first started this work, it was, uh, well, my kid would never do that. And right. of course I was defensive. I was yeah. like, okay, well my kid did. So why don't you tell me what kind of kid does this? Because, and then it made everything awkward and uncomfortable, but I got better at answering, answering that. And I was like, nowadays I tell people, well, your kid might not do it the way Alexander did, but kids, your kid be Catherine right here at Orange County who went to the dentist, got a tooth pulled that after her mom couldn't afford the prescription pain medication that afternoon, she put out that she needed something, a painkiller for the pain. She's gone. Or the boy wow. who's nervous for a first date, friend gives him a Xanax to take the edge off. He's gone. Or the girl who went off to college had really bad menstrual cramps. It's the first big party of the year. Her new room, he's like, here, take this, and then we'll go to the party. She takes it. She's gone. So then it's like, oh, wait, those things can happen. Those things make sense. And then the other thing that gets parents to listen is referring to these deaths as poisoning. So, you know, Alexander took an oxy, what he thought was an oxycodone, what was advertised to him and sold as an oxycodone, turned out it was fentanyl. To me, that would be a poisoning, right? That's for anybody. But when I talk to parents, which what really makes sense is, you know, poisoning, when I say overdose, they're like, never going to happen in my house. Nobody has a drug problem. Why would that happen? But if I say fentanyl poisoning, they're like, oh, tell me more about that. Yeah. And that's because we're conditioned, right? When we're pregnant, when we're, I don't know if you guys have kids, but when those, you know, in those, when you're preparing the home for this baby to come, you're putting child safety locks, you're moving the poisons up to higher shelves, you're putting poison controls phone number on your refrigerator, you're putting it in your phone, you are ready for that moment, your child should get in contact with some poison. So it is a relatable term that makes sense to people. And it opens up the door for that conversation. But even somebody who dies from uh, anybody that really dies from drugs, if they, it, they're all poisonings. I mean, there's no recommended dose of heroin. And why does alcohol, you know, there's recommended servings of alcohol, but if you drink too much, what's it called? Poisoning. Yeah. Why, why can't that same rule apply? I've had alcohol poisoning. Before. That's no fun. Wow. Yeah. 15. It's the only time. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Bacardi 151. <laughs> can you, can you drink it now? <laughs> I don't drink at all. Uh, oh, well, that's true. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. <laughs> I um, can't imagine. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. That's it is poisoning. Well, it's not an overdose. And I think the more these are, we can these are illicit drugs. Yeah, these, these are. aren't drugs that are being uh, administered uh, mm-hmm. by a doctor. Mm-hmm. Right, you're not getting like okay, take one well, every, every day, four, and, every four hours. And take took, one pill every four hours. Yeah, and you take a handful. And, then, okay. and if you're an addict, you take four pills every one hour. Yeah, but. If we can change the narrative around this for everybody, I think that we can open a lot of minds because we, what we have to do is break that old way of thinking, right? We've, we've seen drugs, the war on drugs one way for so long. And we were told for years and years and years, oh, your kids are going to die from drugs and they didn't. And now they are, and it's falling on deaf ears. Right. So let me ask you, who's giving you pushback on the poisoning? Like what group of people? T- typically, it's folks cops. in the extreme harm reduction. No, cops have been amazing. The uh. Uh, DEA has been amazing. Like uh, um, even in our own county here, they've really changed the language on how they talk about these drugs, and and that's fantastic. It it really is c- kind of comes down to the extreme harm reduction community, um, or, or or parents who people who've lost their kids through uh, maybe they were you know addicted for years, and and finally. It, the day finally came where their addiction finally took them. And so they feel like we're minimizing their child's death, but in no way, shape or form would I ever imagine doing that. In fact, I would consider their kid's death a poisoning too. I mean, they didn't want to die. They didn't want to take too much and die. And so I don't, I don't know how to work through that because there's, you know, there's a lot of emotions wrapped up in that. It's, it's very emotionally charged. And so I don't know how to work with that, with the extreme harm reduction community in that respect. Um, I'm open to it. I'm totally willing to have these conversations. And because I think that we all have a lot to offer to the cause. Yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about extreme harm reduction. Uh, Well, I think that... I like abstinence-based. Yeah, I mean, really, prevention and abstinence-based really is what's going to save lives these days because... 
I, I mean, with maybe if this was seven, 10 years ago and we were still dealing with heroin, maybe extreme harm reduction would be okay because at some point those folks might get the chance to yeah. recover. But with fentanyl, it owns your brain. It takes yeah. over completely. Well, plus harm reduction still has the potential of the next use. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That I mean that you, so, they might go one day into a safe use site and be revived, but the next day, yeah, then what? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I want to, I want to be able to save everybody. And so, but again, if we're keeping them alive or we're, we're giving them that next use, like you said, we're, um, when do they have that moment where they can turn it around with fentanyl? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a thing. I'm an addict. You can't, unless you hit some type of bottom, rock bottom, um, you know, like you, you're, you're out of needles, you're out of drugs, uh, you're out of money. Um, things are really, really bad. Um, I mean, emo your family has, you know, set tight boundaries on you and, and you know, mm -hmm. it's like, I had to, I had to be, I had to be, I had to be arrested. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hear that a lot. Actually. I, I got sober because I got arrested. Yeah. I got sober because every time I went to detox at a, at a regular facility, I would leave or I would bring drugs in and use for a little while and get kicked out. But when I finally got arrested and I wasn't let out for seven days, my psychosis went away. Mm -hmm. I detoxed in jail. Mm -hmm. But the problem is now in Orange County jail, they're giving Suboxone to everybody or Subutex, one of the two, which I don't, I don't like. I'm not a fan of, uh, of um, long-term uh, buprenorphine use mm -hmm. um, because that is highly addictive as well. And it's um, harder to come off of um, buprenorphine then it, it, it's very close to methadone. Okay. It's actually harder to come off of buprenorphine than it is fentanyl. Fentanyl, fentanyl is hard for like 48 hours, 72 hours, because you can't administer any buprenorphine. So mm -hmm. they have to be in mm -hmm. severe withdrawals before you can admin right. administer the buprenorphine. Otherwise, they go into per precipitated withdrawals. Yeah. Um, and then they that's like worse, right, wow. than the withdrawal they're mm -hmm. already in. But a lot of times what happens with the fentanyl is they leave because they can't, they can't handle that. Yeah. That 72 mm -hmm. hours, um, before their, uh, they're, they're called cow scores before their cow scores are high enough for them to actually take the fentanyl. I mean, not the fentanyl, the buprenorphine. Yeah. I, um, I think buprenorphine is great for, uh, detoxification. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so you like ramp it, use it and then kind of wean people off of it. Whoosh, whoosh. And what, what would that, what's the time frame on something like that? I mean, we don't do it for more than seven days. Okay. Um, rarely. Uh, that's a, I. I should. I. I say that, um, but I'm saying that specifically about Hope by the Sea. We don't. We don't use a um, Suboxone or Subutex for um, Sublocate sometimes, mm -hmm. which is the injection, because uh, especially uh, Sub um, Subutex is so easy to abuse. You you take it. As soon as it goes away, you want to get loaded, you can get loaded for a couple of days and go right back on it. Yeah. You know, so it's not. It's an on again, off again. It's an on again, off again relationship. So it's, it's really not that, not that good. The sublocate and a lot of, a lot of addicts, 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 or people that are trying to get clean or want to get clean. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't want to get clean. Um, they don't want to use the sublocate because you can't um, get around the sublocate. Because it's a thirty day injection. Oh wow! So you get one in, one in, one injection every thirty days, and you're stuck with it. And you're stuck <laughs> with it. You're not using you're not using opioids for thirty days. Well, I can imagine that's a scary thought for somebody, right? Like, how am I going to survive thirty days if I if I don't have that? Right. We all do it. I've done it. You didn't smoke crack for thirty days, right? It's been 15 years. <laughs> so it's probably been a little longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> you went 30 days without smoking crack, right? I did, yeah. But that first 30 days seemed like a long time. Just the mental. Right? Just the mental? Just the mental. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of mental stuff. You know, once I got over the mental, I was back. Yeah. Um, I'm just stuck on, uh, on the kid, on Alex. Sure. Me too. You know? I mean, like, what more was was there? I mean... You know... Alex, for all accounts, he was a pretty typical kid. That, how, grades okay? Grades were, no. He, Alex was did not like school. He okay. was super, like, mass genius, but 
hated schoolwork. Like yep. trying to do homework and things was 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 a challenge yep. <laughs> from very early on. But he could go in and ace a test just fine. Mm. So he was that type of kid, yeah. <laughs> um, you know. And he was always had really big ideas about the world. He loved history. He had always kind of thought he'd be like a director of a Smithsonian at some point in his life. That was his uh, big goal. He he was pretty typical. He was running a little eBay business at the time, selling off his childhood mm-hmm. toys, and he was really good about it. He put everything on eBay. He packaged up all of his packages. In fact, after he died, some of his packages still sold, and we had. I mean, it was so hard to just go deliver these packages to the UPS store. It was, it was, it was heartbreaking. You know, um, we eventually turned everything off because we didn't want to deal with that. Uh, but in the beginning, it we we missed a couple of things and people on eBay were mad because they didn't get their package. I'm like, look, dude, he just died. What do you want from me? <laughs> like, I can't, right. it's hard. It's hard to wake up right now. We'll get your package to you. But he, and he was, but he, like I said, he was good at that. He always had this entrepreneurial spirit. He, when he was little, had business ideas all the time. And so he had two lizards, two bearded dragons and his, there were two rare colors, colors and his goal was to breed them and then sell them back to pet stores. But he always had some idea going on about what he could do. Um, in fact, he had this thought that he would be a, he wanted to have a um, dispensary. That was uh, one of his latest ideas that he had because he saw a lot of money in that. And I was like, okay, rather than being like, oh no, you can't do that. You shouldn't be selling weed to people. We took the approach of, okay, well, what kind of education and background would you need for that? Do you want to take some horticulture classes no. this summer? Like, I'm not trying to foster the fact that he wanted to have a dispensary, but if he got into horticulture, who knows, maybe he'd have some other ideas and things that he might want to do, but like tomatoes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe he'd want to grow to be a tomato farmer. <laughs> I don't know, but, um, he, so he was always, always thinking in big ways all the time and educating people about it all the time. Um, he was diagnosed with ADD the fall before he passed away. And, you know, we had always seen ADD as this, uh, kids can't hold focus they're hyperactive. And so that's what ADD was. That's what we thought. But we learned that there's seven different types. And Alex had this ring of fire type where his brain was super overactive, constantly thinking, um, a lot of noise in his brain, if you will. And so uh, we were really working on that, going from least invasive to most invasive treatment. Um, in fact, Alex probably had, you know, was ADD his whole life, but we had been fortunate enough to where the, his teachers at his school always accommodated him, gave him the standing desk, let him walk around the room when he was feeling anxious or whatever was going on. And so there was all these tools in place, but when he got to middle school, those things kind of went away. And we didn't recognize that as, as ADD yet. It wasn't until, um, like I said, that he was 13. It was the fall of um, eighth grade that we finally, we put him in counseling and found a really great person who uh, what was going to work with us on that. And then uh, he, we were working on that. And then the pandemic hit. And of course, that stuff all kind of went away for people and made things even harder because we had this little bit of traction going yeah. with this. And so, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to get to stick with that. But he was adorable, too. <laughs> he was absolutely adorable. In fact, there was this, I can remember... Uh, shortly, but right January before he passed away, he, he was mad at us for setting up this false reality is what he was telling us. I'm like, what does that even mean? He's like, you guys tell me I'm cute. And he was like feeling bad about his looks or whatever. I'm not even, I'm not sure what took him down that path, but he started at this new school, met these girls and he comes home and he's like, I have to apologize to you guys. I'm like, okay, why? He goes, oh, because I am cute. The girls at school like me. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Okay. If that's what it takes, I guess, then great. I accept your apology. <laughs> so he was 14. Yeah. He was barely 14. Barely 14. Mm-hmm. He'd be 17 now. Yeah. He would have been se- turned 17 back in May. It's crazy to think that. I, mean, I always think about, what would Alex think of this? But I don't really know what 14 year old Alex thinks of it. I always imagine like what would those fights about him learning to drive would have looked like, you know, because I'm sure it would have been intense. Yeah. My son is 17. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we both have kids. He has three. I have three. Oh, wow. I have a 15 year old daughter right now. Oh yeah. I have a 15 year old daughter. Mm-hmm. Oh, she, she's amazing. I love her so much. I mean, obviously I loved her so much before, but yeah. she's really an amazing kid. She's always had this magic about her, right? She's she's Alexander's opposite. So where Alex was 
is super like worldly smart. She's the book smart kid. She remembers things like crazy, um, you know, you know, common core math was a big controversial thing, but she would come home and teach me these new math concepts. And I'm like, you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> like what is going on? And yeah. so she really loved that. Uh, she's a musician. And so she puts a lot of her time and effort into music and she's a little bit of an artist. She's created our logos for the Alexander Neville foundation. Nice. Um, she's written me some, you know, social media posts, things like that when I need it. And so she is, uh, she's very close. Like we're very close with both of our kids. You know, she's always been kind of the loner type. Doesn't want people over at the house. And that's, and she's still in that mode. Uh, but an interesting thing happened. Uh, so she turned, when she turned the year, she turned 14. I was really freaking out about that. Right. Cause she's when she actually became like one of the hardest days in all of this. And this probably sounds crazy. was the day she became older than Alex. Like that day was very difficult. Like, like I couldn't think about it without crying. I can't think about it now without crying, but I didn't talk to her about it because I didn't want to plant any seeds. Right. I didn't want, if it's not going to be a big deal to her, then great. It's not going to be a big deal to me. Right. I'm going to downplay it for her sake. But about two weeks before her birthday, she came to me and she's like, I don't want to have my birthday. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so do you want to stay 13 or we skip into 15? How do you want to handle it? She's like, no, I'll be 14, but I, I don't want a birthday party. I, I don't want to go out to dinner. I just want it to be a normal day. I was like, okay, so I agreed to that. But at the same time, Billie Eilish was playing that same night on her birthday. <laughs> so we overcompensated, got her some great tickets, and her dad took her to the Billie, Billie Eilish concert. But it was just a normal day. <laughs> so that's how we handled that. Nice. Yeah, it's tough. It is weird. It is really weird because... She should have her brother, right? They should be fighting and having fun and all the normal things that they used to do. And not like, only that, but there's no rock bottom for these kids. Like when right? you're talking about the rock bottom, <laughs> and, which is what we've learned over the last 20 years, where we have to go, now it's turned to, well... Well, well I mean, the pendulum has swung too far the other direction mm -hmm. to, yeah. to where we're, we're, um, we're too okay with, uh, with, with allowing, um, you know, people to smoke. Method well, yeah, and, and we've normal, we've, everything's been so normalized yeah. through music, media, legalization of marijuana. I'll be honest, when, when California voted on marijuana, I, I voted for it. Great. It's going to get money to schools. I'm going to be the one to teach my kids about these things, all those things. But I didn't know that it was going to be genetically modified to be so strong. And I didn't know that my 14 year old would be like, well, it's legal. Like, no, it's not legal for you. And we'd talk about those things, but it, it breaks down the, the, the danger factor yeah. or because we know that these kids it's it's killing their frontal lobes right now Maybe. they're going to the hospital in record numbers yeah. because of, of marijuana induced issues yeah. and so you know we're just on this path to to making everything warm and fuzzy and gentle and and and, and our kids are kind of paying the price for it yep. you know i agree because even i mean even up, up until about a year and a half ago when I would used to get a call uh, and the woman or the father or the loved one would say, yeah, my kid is doing marijuana. I'd take the phone and like, oh, come on, Jesus, come What's on. What's the big deal, right? What the fuck? But now it's changed. Mm -hmm. It's totally, and I hear it all the time from parents. Uh, What's the big deal? I did it when I was high school. Yeah, I turned out okay. And I'm different. like, you're right. It was okay when you were in high school. You're talking about a two to 4% THC. Yeah. Our kids are getting on average 80%. Yeah. Like that is killing their frontal lobes. Yeah. At the very least, the, the minimum thing that's going to happen is they're going to be a bunch of dumb 24 and 25 year olds when they get there, right? That's like the going to be the least problem that they have. But as it is, it's the marijuana induced psychosis, it's the paranoia, the, the schizophrenia, yeah. all the things that are happening to them right now, and and the suicide ideation is driven by that. Yeah, there's a there's some, and we see we actually see it in the treatment centers uh, of a. a, a, a and it's hard to it's hard to say what the real deal is, but um, was this uh, patient potentially going to be schizophrenic anyways? Sure, sure. Or did the um, excessive marijuana use push them over the edge? Push them over it, or unlock it, or make or it worse than it. maybe it would have exactly. been. It's happening. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. We see it. You know, we see it in this treatment uh, center. I mean, right now though. Um, the fentanyl is such a crisis. Yeah, that absolutely. is that is ninety five percent of what we see. I believe the it. other five percent is older alcoholics. Okay, you know. But other than that, there we don't 
really get a patient in here in any of our six treatment, well, two of them are mental health, but any of the um, four treatment centers mm -hmm. that aren't addicted to fentanyl. It I is, believe it. it is I believe it because I mean, what else is out there, right? What, there's nothing. There's no heroin out right. on the streets. Like, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a sad thing for me to say, but can we bring back heroin sure. and get well, rid of the fucking fentanyl? You know, and that was the thing Alex said to us that night when he was pouring his heart out to us. He's like, this is what leads to heroin and I don't want to do heroin. Yeah. I mean. If, In 2020, there was still a tiny bit of heroin. There was. But there is no more heroin. There is zero. I'm sure I, I'm sure I could, I, I'm sure I could find it. Mm. Um, it's going to be expensive. Yeah. But. It's possibly going to be also uh, sprinkled with um, yeah, fentanyl, gonna, right? So you know, it, it, it's and I've been um, <clears throat> twenty-two years. I've worked in the treatment industry. Uh, almost twenty-one years have I owned a treatment center. Um, I have never seen so much death in three God. in the three years since, like, right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's really been four years. Mm -hmm. Four years. That's in, that's it, wild. It, it's just insane. There's been more death in those four years mm -hmm. than the previous eighteen. Mm -hmm. You know, I say it often, but like I'm just gonna. I, I, what did we What did we say yesterday? If you if people need to hear it seven times, yeah, before be, they get it, before they get it, like mm -hmm. that's the whole marketing strategy, right? Yeah. I mean, it how is. Do, how do you do that to somebody when they're not even not a even presence listening? of mind to? I haven't Listen. listened to the podcast mm -hmm. all the way to this point <laughs> yeah. where I'm saying it again. <laughs> right. Like it, people are dying mm -hmm. in record numbers. You just have to go look at the statistics mm -hmm. and we don't even know what 2023 is bringing. Oh we, uh, you know, we lost. Um, and so we have a, we have a good friend of ours that um, just passed away uh, about eight weeks ago. Um, yeah. He was our basketball teammate, Bobby. Uh, he was, he was, you can watch his podcast. He was one of our, one of our, uh, what? For top 10. Top guests. 10 for yep. top, t uh, first 10, not top 10. Okay. I mean, it, it's a, to me now it's the number one podcast because wow. he's no longer here. Right. Mm -hmm, sure. Amazing story. Um, probably died like three, four, four weeks after, no, uh, probably <sighs> like six weeks yeah. after the podcast. Mm -hmm. He just had, he had a lot of internal pain mm -hmm. and, um, I got a call from his mom or a text from his mom um, who was up in Washington. Actually, I'm wearing his shirt right now. Oh, yeah? So this is his okay. clothing company. It's mm -hmm. called Clean Cartel. Um, and I got a text from his mom. Uh, she's up in Washington, and he, he was down here in South Orange County. And she said, I just got a phone call that Bobby's dead. Oh. Can you find out? Oh, so she wasn't even sure. Yeah. Cause he had a psycho girlfriend that could lie. She was sure. crazy, oh. crazy. And no you one, sh no one should go through this again. He, everybody deserves a chance to recover. Yeah. And fentanyl is robbing them of that. Yeah. His, his story is amazing. Um, you know, and I think, uh, as, as this podcast grows, his death won't definitely won't be in vain either. Yeah. We have You've memorialized. We him. have, we have, mm -hmm. um, and it was rough. Shane and I did the uh, his his local memorial here, and then we had about a hundred people show up here, and then they had like three hundred up in up in uh, wow. Washington where he's from. And it's just it's just sad because like you know his mom's in pain. Sure. You know, his sister, brother, grandma. It's just not fair. You know. Yeah. It. it, it, and it it, how do we slow that down? How do we at least slow this down? We okay, gotta slow it we down. We can't solve it, but how do we slow it down? And I think that that's where the knowledge comes in, and and really getting the general public to listen. Because right. um, you know, I I'll do things like this, or I've been on the news or whatever, and people, I get the messages. Oh, you're a horrible parent. That's why your kid's dead. You gave your kids too much. You gave your kid too much access. Your kid. That's why your kid's dead. You know. And, you know, like, I don't beat myself enough up about this every single day, right? We were just talking about this the other day. We get like a that. lot of, we get a, we, we don't get a lot. We get, we, the majority of the stuff that we get is very, mm -hmm. you know. And most doing people, what you're doing. some are trolls, but then yeah. there's some people who genuinely, they're stuck in the old mindset. You know, it, it's, 
you chose to you chose to do drugs and you died well that's on you wait until one of their family members yeah, exactly i mean which is really only a matter of time yeah and so i stopped reading comments so that's the number one rule yeah. don't read the comments yeah well, we took that advice from joe rogan <laughs> yeah. joe, joe rogan says uh, i i have my my biggest rule is i never read the comments, read the comments. so say whatever you want to say about me mm-hmm Say whatever you want. Sometimes they slip through though, right? They find your email address. What (laughs) happens is sometimes is like on, say like on Instagram, Mm -hmm. if you actually like, you know, run your Instagram, Mm -hmm. something will pop up at the, in the priority section and you'll see it. And I'm like, I did it yesterday. I mean, I bit, I bit like it was day before yesterday. I bit on this lady's negative oh. comment and I commented oh. back. <laughs> I, cu- I couldn't help myself. You just, sort of the compulsion was there. Yeah, sure. it was saying That's I just, where I got my first negative comment was on Instagram, actually the first disparaging thing. But the worst was an email I got that told me my daughter's going to die the same way because I'm a horrible parent. God. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost you know, like you've got to be a it's helicopter it's, parent sometimes though. No, you don't. Well, I mean, come on. You sometimes don't. you do. Well, it's I hard. I, I, I parent totally different than that. Like I'm very like I I'm I I yeah, so I you have I'm some. very um <laughs> I give my kids a lot of uh, privacy their own mm-hmm. stuff. Now my my wife and my 15 year old daughter she she's quite the opposite. She uh, reads everything <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I can we've just always had these conversations with our kids, and yeah. so nothing. And when things big deal things might happen. My husband and I were very good about not freaking out and being like, oh my gosh, why did you do that? Why is this happening? Why is this, you know, okay, this, this thing has happened. Okay, what's our next move? You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? Alex, what would you like us to do in your, if, if you were the parent, what, how would you like to see this through? You know, right. really keeping it open and, and kind of a, a group effort when things came up, like, you know, grades were always a thing like, okay, like if you're going to fail, you're going to fail. Like, are we going to, is that what you really want? And you know, or how, do you need to do just what's enough to get by? Like, how do you want this to impact your future? And so, you know, hopefully thought provoking stuff where he'd come back and be like, okay, so here, I'd like to do good in these classes because I really like them. Um, but I don't care about my math class. I'm like, okay, well, you have to pass it. So yeah. what do you have to do to pass your math class? Right. But, you know, when it boiled down to it, it wasn't necessarily his math class that he didn't like. It was the teacher he didn't have a good rapport with. Right. History class, he always loved history. You know, in, in seventh grade, he got off to a rocky start with his history teacher and his math teacher. His history teacher was able to see Alex differently after they got off to a rocky start. Alex was just being obnoxious in class. But they turned it around, and Alex had a great year. His math teacher never saw him any other way mm. that whole year. So Alex was kind of pigeonholed as yeah. a ruckus in class, and, and so it made that class difficult for him. Yeah. You know, And it, same thing with uh, there was two assistant principals at the middle school he went to at the time. And I mean, I say Alex got in trouble. Alex never did anything, never hurt anybody. Never. He was just, but sometimes one time he was spamming his, the text to tip line, (laughs) just spamming it, boarding class one day, spamming the text to tip line that's supposed to be anonymous. So eventually he did it enough that they looked up who was spamming the text to tip line. And then one time he put something in a teacher's uh, classroom that he was going to DOS the class, which meant something about messing up the electronic system but then he removed it but before he removed it in that minute somebody saw it right so those are two things he got in trouble for one assistant principal uh was very hard on him and was like i'm watching you you better stay out of trouble that type of thing the other assistant principal was very much like how's it going today is there anything i can do for you and got through to alex and alex felt okay in that person's presence where the other one that assistant principal shows up he instantly felt like he was in trouble whether anything was happening or not yeah i don't think that i don't i don't i don't think that that that, that that hard hard line uh you know d- works for kids um, well not all kids but i also think that you know everybody parents however they parent and like you know if you are a helicopter parent that's okay no no, i'm not i'm just saying is a time we're in paranoia right yeah, like as a paranoid parano- reaction yeah, like par- oh my yeah, gosh exactly. i have to watch my kids every move to right? keep them alive that's sure. what i'm saying like back in the old days sure. mom would say don't get a disease when you go to the bar then i mean the shit to- that, that we did as a well, kid that's what i'm like, saying I'm like <laughs> we were riding you- motorcycles with no helmets right? jump, jumping those stupid atcs yeah. off of double yes. jumps yes. i mean jumping off of drunk off of freaking two-story yeah. buildings into like shallow ends of swimming pools yeah. I, it's like how did we survive, how did survive? Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you know i there's no real answer to this question because it's like maybe maybe our you know maybe your child and maybe my uh, son-in-law maybe they died for a reason you know sometimes i have to i, I 
tell myself that, right? Like Alex had to to die to to get the word out. I, I, but it was just ridiculous because if you know, I'd much rather have him here than be sitting here with for you guys. Sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so sometimes I try to um, um, reason that out in my head, right? Use that as like some weird justification. Uh, I recently it was last week. I was babysitting my friend's seven year old daughter and. Her brother drowned a little over, her four-year-old brother drowned a little over a year ago. And she was talking to me about her brother's death, and she was talking about Alex's death, and she was asking me a lot of questions. And then she goes, this is God's fault. She got really angry and, and crying, and she's like, we want them here. This is God's fault. And that 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 took me by surprise, right, because she's seven years old. And this is the, con- and I wasn't, we, I wasn't talking about God. I wasn't talking about religion. I was just talking about the facts of what happened to Alex and the facts of what happened to her brother. And this was her conclusion, because we're talking about accidents, yeah. how accidents happen. And then she's like, this is God's fault. And I was like, well, I mean, that's one way you could look at it. And here's what some people believe. And I talked about how that's the pr- approach I took with her. But maybe God needed them. Um, and so we could get this message out because her mom works on drowning prevention now and um, ha- is a very very big voice in that. And so, you know, try you know, seven years old. That's a lot. That's, that's a, a lot. that's a lot. That's a big concept to carry around now. And so I was trying yeah. to talk her off that ledge a little bit. And and yeah, I mean, there's uh, it's, it's all it's all tragedy. My uh, my my uh, very very dear friend uh, went to the beach every day, all the time. Um, but on Memorial, uh, not Memorial, Labor Day, uh, like I think it's coming up on six or seven years, six years, him and his son dove into the wave at the same time and his son came up and he never came up. Wow. He came up, uh, like eight minutes later, seven minutes wow. later, 300 yards away. So yeah, I, but we all believe he had hit his head and got knocked out and he drowned. Wow. You know? Crazy. Yeah, and I mean, like, it's like it's trying to get that concept of acts, shit happens. These bad things happen, and there's sometimes you, you know there's nothing you can do about it. I remember what my comment was uh, the other day because I I said on one of my uh, short reels on on Instagram that um, that you know I I believe that God takes people when when um, when He's ready to take them, and there's nothing that we can do to change that because it's His decision to take well, them. I, I can be mad about that. Yeah, we can be mad about it. I wouldn't be mad about that because because I want my kid. You know, I I would. Yeah, you do. If I could do it all over again, you know, I would. I don't change a lot of things. Which I I think about that sometimes though because I felt like we did a good job as parents, you know. But you know, I would ch- the one thing I would have changed uh, most definitely was when he was allowed on social media and got a phone. A hundred percent, I would change that. And I, I, I really think most kids should, most families should wait until their kid's brain is a little more developed and, and more mature. Uh, and then you have to have these conversations of the harms that are out there on these platforms. I mean, when we send them out to the world, don't talk to strangers, you know, don't take candy from a stranger, all those things, right? We prepare them for all those things. We need that same kind of preparation before they hit the internet. Right. Eminem didn't let his child on until she was 18. That You know what? I would fully support that 100%. You know, I have a, a friend now, um, the friend who lost her son on the same day we lost Alex. They, did, they didn't let their kid have a phone until he was 16. They felt, you know, he felt he was the last kid in the world to get a phone, right? And they didn't let him on social media until he was 16. When did he die? When he was 16 years old. I mean, again, you think you're doing all the things you're supposed to do, and, and you still end up in this space. Yeah. And you can go back and think about all the things that you can change, yeah. but would it have made a difference? Yeah, I don't know. I think I I think and, and with Alexander if if drugs were still happening in dark scary places, he wouldn't have ventured to dark scary places. I right. mean, this kid graffiti showed up in our neighborhood here in South Orange County and he's like, "Ooh, we live in the bad neighborhood." I'm like, "Don't be ridiculous." <laughs> like, it's just graffiti. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> um uh so he was he was a big chicken. Like scary things were scary to him. I mean, yeah. roller coasters, scary one thing. Like he loved that, but to go to a place that he perceived as dangerous made him really nervous. And I don't I don't think at fourteen he would have ventured into those spaces. Maybe at sixteen he would have. I don't know. Right. 
soon as he could drive, I don't know what would have happened. I can't ever imagine I would have let him drive ever. <laughs> no, I hear you. That was a scary day. My, I bet. <clears throat> my, my oldest didn't drive until she was 18. Yeah. My son, um, you know, and I've gotten calls of both of them being in a car accident. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. You don't have that yet. No. Oh, man. I, well, I'm really working on convincing my daughter not to drive <laughs> ever. I'm like, I will drive you forever, yeah. ever and ever and ever. And I love that time in the car with the kids anyway. It's the best. Get yeah, the best well, everything changes uh, as soon as they get a car. Everything changes. They, you, they no longer need you anymore. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I still need to be needed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not ready for that big change. Not ready. Yes. I remember, so that the week before Alex passed away, he and his dad were talking about teaching him how to drive. And they were trying to convince me to let them go to the empty parking lot over at the Ziggurat building, right? Yeah. And, and and drive around. I'm like, no way. And absolutely no. I said, because as soon as Alex thinks he knows how to drive, he's going to take the car. I know this kid. Like, absolutely not. So that didn't, did that. that didn't happen. <laughs> did you? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Probably like 14, too. Yeah. Yeah. My parents would leave on, like, trips and they would leave the keys in, in a drawer. Yeah, I, just, I yeah. thought they just left them there so I could borrow the car. Sure, for, that's totally why. <laughs> yeah. 15 for sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Once you, I mean, boys, especially right. Yeah, the I impulse grow. control at that yeah. age, you think you know how to do things. You're invincible. Why not? Yeah. Took my dad's a 1970 Stingray with the 454 engine. Well, of course you took that it's one. It's a good car, bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good car. To, drove it out, drove it probably. It's a sick fifth, car. What color? Ten, uh, it was blue. Nice. Two-door uh, or four-door? Two-door. Nice. Do Those Corvette, are collectors now. Do Corvettes come in a four-door? Yeah. Huh? No. I had T-tops. Went and picked up my girlfriend, my 15-year-old girlfriend. That's awesome. Red, oh, my God. Redlands. If her parents only knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're from Redlands. I don't think they would have cared. <laughs> her mom was pretty strict, I recall. <laughs> I was joking, Redlands. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking. We love you, Redlands. Yeah, we love you, Redlands. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, Funny. never been. The Inland Empire. Yeah, well, yeah. I've maybe driven through. I grew up in a little town called Grand Terrace. Where's that? Um, just past Riverside. Oh, okay. Like the fr as soon as you on on the ninety one, as soon as it turns into like the two fifteen, mm -hmm. it becomes Riverside. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, San Bernardino County, mm -hmm. first little city right there is Grand Terrace. Oh, who knew there was another little city right there? Yeah, nobody. Oh. It's really small. Wow. Kind of like San Juan Capistrano. One, yeah. one exit. One little exit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you're done. I think we got two. Ortega and uh, Camino Cap, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll get you here. It's not a lot of people in, in San Juan. Though, so like, I like, like San Juan. Population though. of 30,000. Oh, yeah? I like to keep it that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. then we should stop talking about it. <laughs> San Juan is a horrible place to live. <laughs> This Weather's is great restaurant. Great restaurants near the beach. <laughs> the little, fun little shopping district. Uh, <laughs> really good Mexican food restaurants here. Yeah, it's nice over here. Rick Ricardo's. Can I get a sponsor? Oh yeah, Ricardo's. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, Ricardo's. <laughs> and uh, there's this other one though that is um, El El. What is it? No, El Capitan. I forget what it is. Yeah. But it's it's like authentic. You know, it's authentic when you walk in and. Nobody speaks English, <laughs> and you're the only white you're guy. You're getting in the there. real deal. Oh, it's the real deal. It's like really good food. El Campeon, that's what it's called. El Campeon. El Campeon. Yeah, it's right on the corner of uh, Camino Cap and Del Obispo. Oh, I'll have to go by there. Yeah, for sure. I'm just trying to get sponsorships. Yeah, so yeah. Just trying to go the whole list. What else is in the area? <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit about the... I got to um, ask something. Okay, go ahead. I just want to know, like, just for that other mother out there, mm -hmm. she's in your exact position. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're acting weird. What's going on? He lies the first time. He comes to you the next day, says, yeah, I'm doing oxys. Mm -hmm. And then you tell him, hey, don't do one tonight. Mm -hmm. You already knew he's doing the oxys. We know now that it's an addiction mm -hmm. and they're doing it for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. We just can't say stop. Right. That doesn't work. And we can't say that it's just the oxys. We can't yeah. say that's just right. the oxys. So right. Cause I thought it was just an oxy. Right. right. One so, oxy. So one oxy. Now that we know this them. today, what do we tell that parents? Say, that, well, that, you know, usually when I give a presentation, I will tell people, I, it, I, it, I'll say, you know, the treatment center called me back literally four minutes after Alexander's time of death. Mm. 
um, that message is still on my phone. I haven't listened to it. I never will listen to that because it's too late, right? But I should just delete it. Um, but I tell people that because of the urgency. Like if someone is experimenting or you know they're hooked, whatever the case may be, they need help and they need it right now. I will tell people like, if you know somebody, leave this presentation right now and get them to the emergency room. You do not have time. You absolutely do not have time. And that is, is and, and it sounds very dramatic, I know that, but it is the reality of the situation. Yeah. Those are facts. That, those are facts. Those are facts today. Mm-hmm. Those weren't facts five years no, ago. No, I know. I mean, when Alex died, again, had he taken an oxy that day, he'd still be with yeah. us. Like it, it, That would not have killed him. Yeah. And who knew? Who knew? Nobody was talking about it. So but let's just go through it. Even say that night. Let's just say hypothetically, yeah. you take your kid to the fucking hospital. Mm-hmm. They're going to go, you're crazy, lady. Go home. Well, uh, who kn- you know, they probably would have, if I had said he was a danger to himself as a kid, they right. would have at least kept us overnight. Okay. That would have bought right. us overnight, right? So do whatever you can um, and then, at that point. Right. And so when I think back to that, that 24 hours or 36 hours I had to learn about fentanyl, the one little hold, the one little part where I, I think could have had the greatest impact is when I called that treatment place. And they needed to call me back with their recommendation. If they had just said, and this isn't their fault. They probably didn't even know themselves, right? Hey, we need to call you back with our recommendation. But in the meantime, you need to know about fentanyl. And I would have been off to the races with that sent one little sentence. You know, that would have, that could have really changed things. Had I heard, of, you know, just known about it that day. I don't even think though that in the treatment world. No, I don't really think they, no, I, I, I don't fault them for that. Because yeah, they we didn't just know. Didn't, we just didn't, it wasn't. It was it wasn't what it is now. Yeah. Like now we see it constantly. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean we see death constantly. Uh we see overdoses every day. Mm-hmm. It's just not I mean not every day, but weekly. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I I, I, I don't doubt that. It's crazy. So, you know, we have to we ju- we have to react with urgency. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And then when it's you a, call that treatment center and they're like, oh, well, you know, we got to wait. Well, then that person. Call, call like, another one. Chain them to your side. And that's what you I know? meant by becoming a helicopter. At that point. In, yeah. in those moments, that's absolutely. When you, yeah. when you, if your kid comes to you and tells you, hey, I've been experimenting. And I've met families who've lost their kids. Like, oh, we were getting them in treatment. We thought we had, we thought we had time, right? We right. thought we could wait the weekend. Or I find kids who I've met families who didn't know their kid was using their kid tries to lock themselves away for a weekend and quit and they can't you know these kids think they can go stop on their own and they can't and and we they we need to help them we have to get into their business when it comes to these things yes mood swings are part of puberty but they're also part of the this horrible illicit substance uh you know it and, and it's hard because some kids, you know, like Alex was still, we were having dinner together every night. And like yeah. said, the night before he died, he and his dad hung out and watched movies, like all the normal routines. Uh, but if your kid, you know, if there's a slightest change in behavior, maybe it's not drugs, but maybe they're being bullied. Maybe they just had a fight with their best friend. There's something else going on when their behavior changes, when there's a shift, something is going on and we, you got to get to the root cause of that. Right. Um, I just wanted to kind of wrap up with a little bit more just about your foundation mm-hmm. and um, how people can get involved. And well, uh, We have our website, the Alexander, uh, Alexander Neville Foundation dot org or ANF help dot org. And uh, there's a contact me form on there. You can contact me through that. Um, I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody, help you put together your own community presentations. I do that a lot. Uh, come to your community or just talk to you if you're a bereaved parent and you just need someone that knows what you're going through. Like, I get it. I know. Unfortunately, I know. And the only time I really feel normal is when I'm around other people that know. Right. Because um, I don't have to, you know, I'm not anticipating those questions of, oh, do you have other kids? <laughs> like, you know, or whatever, whatever they're going to ask me about my life, you know, or what do you do for a living or what have you. And so uh, we'll talk about these things. And we have a film on our, on our website called Dead on Arrival. Uh, it is, if you need to get some quick information to somebody, it's 20 minutes long. Have them watch it. You know, have them absolutely watch it. Awesome. Okay. We'll watch it. Yeah, we'll watch cool. it. Like okay. right after. Cool. Yeah. I'll go get the popcorn. <laughs> 
Yeah, and if we can help, I don't know if there's some outreach we can do. We can bring our cameras. We have, we have, uh, you know, we we go live. I don't know what you guys are doing Friday, but we have the uh, social media victims remembrance day happening at the crime victim monument in uh, Santa Ana, two o'clock Friday afternoon. We could go there. Yeah, yeah. Let's and do then that. we're free. Yeah, we're free. We yeah. have. A, we have. We, a we actually clock. have. Uh, are we allowed to bring cameras? Sure. Because we were we were actually going to be filming on. Friday. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to have, I, I would imagine media is going to show up. They've showed up to all of our rallies and things we've had in front of Snapchat. So that's been a thing. Um, I imagine there's going to be media there, yeah. but even if there's not, yeah. Send me the address. We'll, we'll okay. be there. We sure. want to, we want to show up wherever media is because we're okay. going to start being really loud. Yeah. Um, well, August 21st is national fentanyl prevention and awareness day. And there will be an event here in California, probably on the 20th. Those details are being hashed out right now. And then on the 21st, we'll, probably be in new york city for an event there uh so there's those things are coming up you can you can find that out at the facing fentanyl facing fentanyl now.org website and it'll give you more information who, about that who, who is that facing fentanyl now is made up of the alexander neville foundation voices for awareness and void victims of illicit drugs our three organizations make up that kind of consortium if you will and Andrea Thomas, who is uh, heads Voices for Awareness, it was her vision. She's really the brains behind all of it. In fact, you should have her on the show. I'll give you her information. Yeah, She's okay. amazing. I absolutely love her. Awesome. Yeah, we have uh, we have a sister podcast uh, yeah. called Jenny Sober Lifestyle. I think you met her. Okay. Um, and uh, we we're, we're doing a lot of collaborating, and um, uh, we're going. We have a. Uh, almost like a reality TV podcast, mm -hmm. um, YouTube show, okay. channel show. Mm -hmm. It's going to be called Sober Legacy, and it's uh, just going to be showing um, that you can have fun and That's sobriety. Awesome. You can uh, live a sober lifestyle, and you can leave a legacy. That's incredible. You know, there's so many people that are. Um, you We're going to have to get you some teens for that program. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're we're down. We want we, whatever we can do to help. We're in. Excellent. Yeah. Especially in this kind of this arena right here. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, in Orange County, fentanyl is the number one killer of seventeen and under. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah, I did. I I, I, I believe it's isn't it like nationwide though? Like nationwide, it's been eighteen to forty five years old. Eighteen, 18 to forty five. Forty five. Uh, but the CDC just came out with their provisional numbers. I don't know the breakout by age, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's now sixteen to forty five. Yeah. It, it really wouldn't surprise me if it was thirteen to forty five year olds, but. I would expect it to at least be 16 to 45 year olds. Are their numbers accurate? I don't know. Well, <laughs> we, I mean, we know we it's underreported, so. Can we rely on the CDC anymore? Um, I think we can uh, rely on them in the respect of, you know, they say, they came out and said, I think it was 109,000 deaths. I'm, don't quote me on this. We have to go back and look it up. I don't have it all committed to memory yet. But about 72% of that was fentanyl related. So we can look at those percentages, I think, and and, and apply those to other things. And, and that's good. But something interesting. It gives us a good enough. Yes. It, it gives us a, something to go off of. I mean, 109,000 deaths is outrageous, right? But yeah. the first article I read about it was like, oh, there's 109,000 deaths. That's uh, that's a two percent increase. Oh, things are things are getting better. Like no, no, no. That's still one hundred nine thousand deaths. That's there's nothing better about that considering where we've come from. Right. No, the numbers are growing, not oh, shrinking. Yeah, yeah they're. I mean, and we can attribute that to things like uh, naloxone. The general public finally getting to learn about naloxone and wait things that you can do in these situations. So yeah, it's a lot more to do. It's a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. And, you know, we're, we're open to listening because, like, we don't have the answers. We, d we actually don't yeah. have the answers. We're just building a platform. Right. That's what to, I like all the time. Out right? the, I mean, mm -hmm. the only answer that I can come with uh, uh, up with is, like, annihilating the cartels. Yeah. That, I mean, not, uh, is that really the solution to the problem? <laughs> I don't know. I, because I don't China know. will find another <laughs> have way. Have we tried it? <laughs> yeah, we've never tried it. They say they say that what the, we. I mean, you go back to the 80s, right, when uh, when they started the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. uh that was a war on drug addicts mm -hmm. and, um, you know, low level, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. street dealers. A lot of people who shouldn't have been locked up were, were locked up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I became a convicted felon because I got busted with this much methamphetamines oh, when I was 18 wow. years old, 18, that wow. much convicted felon. Well, you showed them. Lost all my, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> So I was going to say, though, because what, what, what Shane was saying about the helicopter parents, mm -hmm. like I, I was that kid that like the parents all were like, no, you, you can, I don't want my kids hanging out with you, oh. which is probably a good idea at the end of the day. <laughs> but like my parents just loved me. 
Aww. you know, they just sure. loved me and they, they, um, you know, supported me and through, through life. And, um, and at the end of the day, I became more successful than all of those people. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lot of pain and a lot of struggles, but sometimes, man, your kids have to go through pain and struggles. Uh, you know, and then those things are part of life. Absolutely. What is that? What is that saying? How does that saying go? Um, tough times create. Tough, tough times breed weak men. No, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> it's quite times, the opposite. No, sorry, tough times breed strong men. So, I like yeah, to say people. Times. I like to say people sure. because they, you know they, it does say. Well, the men. quote says men. Though. Yeah, I don't want to do. I, I don't like it because it, it, it tough women too, <laughs> tough people. Yeah. In general. Yeah. Um, and like I mean we're kind of in weak times right now. Yeah, we really are. And we're we're breeding weak people. Weak. We need to. We need to. And I mean, you're Be showing better. you're showing me how you're showing me true strength, S true mother warrior strength. I don't know if it's that or if it's just the way to avoid all the pain. Mm. I know it's a weird thing, Either right? Way. I, I no, talk about it's, Alex it's all the time, yeah. but in a weird way, it's, it's avoidance. It's 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 all uh it, it's all it's all perception though, and my perception of of your reality is that you're using um your pain to fuel the fire to actually heal. Thank you. I'll take you know, that. I'll take that today. My dad lost his first son um, when he was 18 months old, got run over by a car. Oh. And he tells me the story of holding his, his son's head and it was just shattered. He didn't he didn't he didn't do any work on it until he was until I became a full blown True. drug addict. And then he went to a family program and it all came out. I bet. But there's a lot of unpacking there. Yeah. The Betty Ford uh, family program. I mean, you're helping other, you're helping other 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 mothers. Thank you. Heal or other mothers from having to go through this. Yeah, that's, that's our goal. That's the goal. That's a my goal too. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to see other mothers have to go through this or fathers. There's there's something a little bit deeper with moms though, you know. Yeah, well, you know, we I mean, not to, be, not to brag, but you gave birth. Yeah, I mean, they were like a part of us at one time. I, I knew she was going there. I, I, knew she was I going. mean, no, I, I agree. Look, if you could give birth, I'd totally let you. No, I can't. I, I'm, I'm a male. I can't. I give mean, if birth. there was a way, I would totally let my husband no. do it instead. No, we, we wouldn't be able it. to handle. No, we, there's no <laughs> freaking we are, way. We are pansies. Wussies. Yeah. yeah. Wuss wimps. Wimps. Yeah. Wimps. Wimps. I like stub my toe and I'm like, Ow. I know. I'm on the ground. I know. <laughs> Me too, bro. Listen, I mean, I'm open to do anything for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's just me. Awesome. You know, I mean, we, 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 we definitely want to be involved. Yeah. In, um, you know, and we can do one of two things too. We can, we can reach out to, uh, to people that are struggling because like we've been mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, uh, I also look pretty handsome in a suit and I All can, right. I can roll straight up to, you know, um, City halls, Congress. I've sat on the floor con of, of Congress before. I've hung out with, uh, you know, people in the House. I'll I know how you. to. There, I know how to do all that. There's some yeah. legislative stuff happening. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. And we're uh, part of the. Um, do you cuss ever? Do you all ever say bad words? All the time. Okay, good. Because <laughs> we're part of the fuck fentanyl movement. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. You are. <laughs> We're also a part of the, the recover out loud movement because mm -hmm. we can't recover in silence. We sure. can't, we can no longer be anonymous because, um, uh, people are dying, um, and we'll no longer be anonymous, um, so that people like you don't have to, uh, go through what you're going through. I think it's, I think it's great. Like we're literally, we do recover out loud. That's, that's our new, uh, movement. That's awesome. Um, so we got a lot of movements, but <laughs> I mean, it's all, it, it all, it all is the same thing at the end of the yeah, day. We're all going, all, we all have the same goal. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. Well, thanks for coming in. Thanks for thanks having for, me. Thanks for being vulnerable. Yeah. Shedding a couple of tears on our <laughs> podcast. Yeah. I went, I went, I went light today on those. Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. Well, when you see me on Friday. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you Friday, two o'clock. Yeah. I'll bring the tears yeah. for sure. All right. We'll be there. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks thank a lot, you. Baby. Thank you. Yeah.